I'm gonna show you how to install Arch from scratch via CLI without any automated installers. After that I'll show you how to install clients for Steam, GOG, Epic and Blizzard games. I think it's really important to do these kinds of tutorials on an actual hardware, so I'm gonna do just that. Meet my desktop. Currently it's running Windows 11 and I'm going to install Arch Linux alongside it on a dedicated NVMe drive. By using separate drives for OS's it's super easy to dual boot. It also turns out you can pretty easily game on an Nvidia card on Linux, but we'll get to that later. All the instructions can also be found on my GitHub repo, which is linked in the description or the pinned comment. First of all, get yourself a USB pendrive with Arch ISO written to it. I am assuming you can operate Azure, Rufus or whatever you want, so I'm just going to skip the boring stuff. Next, you need to enter BIOS and ensure that secure boot is turned off. Otherwise, the Arch Linux installer may not start. Disabling the secure boot does not affect Windows. After that, boot into Arch Linux USB. Partitioning is the first thing you need to do. In my case, I have lots of drives in my system. I would advise you to double check your commands here, because a single mistake can wipe out data on your other drives. The lsblk command is very useful here. It stands for List Block Devices, which simply means it will list all drives in your system, both HDD and SSD, with how they are partitioned. One very important note here, the drive names and identifiers can change, so if you are doing multiple attempts at this tutorial, NVMe 2 and 1 can become NVMe 1 and 1 between reboots. Don't rely on muscle memory, always verify with LSBLK. Okay. Now, I'm using GDisk for partitioning. The disk will have a very simple layout a dedicated 1 gig EFI partition for system boot and a root partition for the rest of the file system. The GDisk will ask you for sectors, but you can actually use typical size units. You can leave the first sector as the default suggested value and input your actual partition size in the next field. Giving no value at all to the last sector assumes all the remaining free space. After you've created the partitions, you need to format them. Typically, EFI partitions use simple file systems, and for that you cannot go wrong with FAT32. For the main file system, I'm going with ext4. It's a well-proven, stable file system. You can go with anything else if you want to. You will not need to make any further changes. Next, we need to mount everything into a cohesive file system. After listing the drives with LSBLK, we can see full partition paths. The bigger main partition goes under slash mnt. Then we create the EFI directory and then we mount EFI partition under it. The hard part is over, now we will install the actual Linux system. In Arch Linux you can do this with Packstrap. First you specify where do you want to install the system and next you give it the list of packages. Base. This is a base system package, Linux. This package includes Linux kernel, Linux headers. This installs additional headers required for NVIDIA driver which we will install later. Linux firmware gives us additional drivers you may require. Depending on whether you have an Intel or AMD processor, you should use Intel U-code or AMD U-code. I have an AMD CPU, so I'm going with AMD U-code. This package provides microcode updates for the CPU. Sudo can give normal users administrator powers. Vim, my preferred text editor, you can use nano, I don't judge. Or care. mkinit cpio, this package is responsible for creating initial boot environment for the kernel. Git, I would say it's good to have, it handles git repositories. EFI boot manager, makes communication with UEFI firmware on your motherboard possible from the OS. Network manager, this package will handle all of the network configuration in the system. After that's done, there's some minimal configuration we still need to perform. Gen FSTab will generate the contents of FSTab, so that our system will know what partitions to mount and where during boot. Now we can enter our freshly installed system using Arch Truth. This basically allows us to act as if we were booted into our installation. 
To be honest, it's a bit more, but for our needs and purposes, it's enough if you see it as just that. Create your user and give it a password. By using vsudo, uncomment the line you see me uncommenting. Now all users belonging to the wheel group can access sudo. Add your user to the wheel group. Enable Network Manager and FSTream Timer, so they will auto-start with the system. You only need to enable FSTream if you have SSD or NVMe installed in your system. Next we need to take care of our boot process. Executing bootctl install populates our EFI partition with all the required files to launch our boot manager called systemdboot. We're using it instead of grub because it's a more modern approach. Systemdboot can actually scan for other EFI binaries to boot the OS and we will make use of that. Open the configuration file for mkinitcpio and uncomment the lines where it refers to UKI. This will make mkinitcpio generate unified kernel images, a single EFI binaries containing all of our kernel and its environment. Comment out the previous options referring to images, so we will not have any unnecessary files in our slash boot directory. Since we'll not be using most of the files in slash boot, delete everything in that directory. Now we need to create a file that will contain startup parameters for our kernel. The kernel needs to know what the root partition unique identifier is, and we're also telling it to mount it in the read-write mode, while being quiet about the startup messages and to display the splash image. Finally, by reinstalling the Linux package, we are triggering the boot binaries build process with our newly configured options. If everything was successful, you should have arch-linux.efi in your EFI, EFI Linux directory. One last thing before we reboot. I'm suggesting you add your own boot entry into the UEFI firmware that will boot into your Arch Linux installation. Some motherboards will auto-detect your initial EFI files the boot CTL has installed. Some will not. Some will name it weirdly. This is a bit of a wild west, so I would say it's best if you configure one yourself. Thankfully, it's easy with EFI boot manager and you only need to do this once. I think what you're seeing is pretty self-explanatory. You could directly point to arch-linux.efi, but by using bootx64.efi we are utilizing systemdboot, and that will detect the Arch Linux image and the fallback images automatically. After that's done, reboot. You should see your entry when entering boot menu on your motherboard during early startup. Systemdboot can also be configured to auto-detect Windows installation and boot into that, but since it's not crucial to this tutorial, I will not talk about that. And personally, I find switching between operating systems by using motherboard boot menu a way more convenient and sure setup. Your current Arch Linux installation can be described as headless. Linux is there, but you don't have a graphical user interface. First, since I have an NVIDIA GPU, I will install the drivers. The drivers require GCC and CMake to be present in the system, so install them first. After that, install NVIDIA Open DKMS and NVIDIA Utils packages and reboot the system. If everything is working fine, the NVIDIA-SMI command should recognize and list your GPU. Now, for the user interface. I'm suggesting you go with KDE Plasma, but you can choose and try anything you want at this point. For Plasma, just install the Plasma Meta package and accept all of the default suggestions by just pressing Enter. So I haven't recorded it, but for a login manager, execute these commands you see on the screen now. 
just be extra careful if you ever want to customize the look of your SDDM login screen, it's very easy to break it. Reboot and log into your graphical environment. Welcome to KDE Plasma. Configure some basic stuff like time zone and keyboard layout. After that, launch Discover, which allows you to install software mainly in the form of flat packs. Install Console, Firefox and Dolphin. The Console is a terminal emulator and Dolphin is the file manager. Your base system is done. Time for some games. We need to configure and install some prerequisites, obviously. Open etc slash locale.gen as root and uncomment the en underscore us dot utfi8 line as you can see in the video. Then execute local dash gen. Install the ttf dash liberation font package. Only then go back to Discover and install Steam from there. Congrats, your Steam is installed. Install Heroic as your intermediary for GOG, Epic or Amazon game libraries. After logging in your games will be visible and available for installation. Installing Blizzard's Battle.net app is a bit more complicated. Using Pac-Man install Lutris, launch it and let some initial downloads finish. You will also need more recent version of Wine, so install Wine staging and configure Lutris so it uses it instead of its default one. Click the plus icon in the top left corner, search for Battle.net and follow the installer instructions. After it's done, do not log in, just close the window. You can use the desktop icon to store the Blizzard tab, and from there you can normally download and launch games. Personally, I've only tested World of Warcraft, and it works fine. With that you should be all set, but don't leave just yet. If you have questions, leave a comment or subscribe and catch me on my live streams. We can debug live, since now I'm mostly streaming from this setup you've just seen me configure. In the future I want to add more monitoring and benchmarking capabilities, so you can expect more about that, but not only. For now, that's all. I think we've been at this for a bit too long, so go play some games and check out this channel later for some other interesting stuff. See ya!